Hello and welcome to Victory On Demand. We hope the service you are about to watch helps you, inspires you, and challenges you in some way that helps you take your next step. We want to connect with you. We know that life is busy and that you may be watching this on maybe a Tuesday afternoon or a Saturday morning or some other day of the week that isn't Sunday. That's the beauty of On Demand and that God can use any of the other 167 hours of the week to connect us back to Him but we wanna be able to include you as part of our church family and help you take your next step, whatever that may be. Let us know that you're here by clicking the button that's popping up on your screen now. No matter who you are, where you are, or what you're struggling with, our goal is to equip you with a new perspective that will give you a better way to do life. And we pray that as you live out God's word, that you would truly experience something more, something better. If you haven't experienced a live Victory service yet, we invite you to visit victorycc.life for more information on when and where you can join us in person or online. We are so glad that you've chosen to be a part of Victory today, and we hope you enjoy our service. song we learned last week. So let's just sing it out this morning to Jesus. There's a day coming when the old will pass away. Every wrong will be made right. No darkness in the night. The sun will This 
again makes us alive again. Let's sing this together. You guys can go ahead and grab a seat. I want to read you from uh, one of Paul's letters to the church in Corinth. And as he's writing to them, he's assuring them, he's, he's letting them know not to worry. He's, he's encouraging them. And he says this at the end of chapter 15. He says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with the immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. And this is from Isaiah, he's quoting. He says, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And that's what we remember this morning. That's what we just declared in song a minute ago. That through that death, we have victory. Through his death and also through the death of ourselves, the dying of ourselves and raising of Christ in us. If we follow him, we've been filled with his spirit and this has kind of been the theme of our entire series, but honestly, it's the theme of all Christianity. Death does not have the final say. In Jesus, we have victory. And this morning, we get to partake in communion together to celebrate that truth. That through his body that was broken, through his blood that was shed, we have victory. We have nothing else to fear. We do not love our lives so much as to shrink from death because we know that death is just the new resurrection. Whatever you're going through in life, we all see brokenness around, brokenness in our families and our relationships, brokenness in the systems uh, that, that, that we interact with in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. There's just brokenness everywhere, as Josh talked about last week, but because of Jesus, that brokenness is made whole. Let's remember that this morning as we take communion. Let me pray, and then we'll do that together. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for this opportunity to gather, to be reminded of this truth as we declare it, we lift these songs and we sing for your honor and your glory alone. It's in Jesus' name, amen.
Hunger lives in every corner of our world. It reveals itself in the places you'd expect and in the ones you don't. It is a complex issue with a range of causes, including unemployment, poverty, economic and political instability, and environmental factors. According to the USDA, 950,220 Hoosiers don't have access to adequate food supplies. 44 million Americans, including one in five children, are without sustainable food, and 820 million people worldwide go hungry. Food insecurity, hunger, and malnutrition are prevalent all around us, even in our own community. But together, we can help fight hunger. One way Victory does this every year is by partnering with Packaway Hunger to pack meals for people in our community and all around the world. Every year, 200 of us Game Changers come together to help fight hunger in the most attended family service event. And every year, we strive to pack at least 30,000 meals together an event which has a price tag of $10,000 to host. But we don't take Jesus' command to feed the hungry lightly here at Victory. And because of our combined generosity throughout this year's Easter offering, that deposit has been paid. And we're excited to announce that we've set our Pack Away Hunger event date for September 15th this year. And registrations to serve at the event are now open. Now the 10,000 that's been given doesn't cover every single dollar needed for supplies, event coordinators, etc. So as in years past, a small sign-up cost of $10 per person will still apply to cover all the rest, but your generosity has made this event so much more accessible and a staple of the local and global outreach of Victory. This event has such a huge impact on hunger here in our community and all around the world, and we want to personally thank you for helping us get this back on our calendar again this year. Together, over the past 13 years, we have packed a combined total of 546,360 meals. And I can't wait to see what we are going to add to that number this year. Because of your generosity, hungry families are being fed. Because of your generosity, people who are facing food insecurity locally and globally are given hope. And we can't do it alone, but together, we can fight hunger. Thank you, Victory. Your generosity is changing lives forever. Aren't you glad to be a church, part of a church uh, where we live out the commands of Jesus and one of those is to feed the hungry. Um, you know, one of the ways we do that is through Pack Away Hunger, over 500,000 meals packed here at Victory. Man, what a, what a, what a thing to, to be a part of, what a thing to celebrate. Uh, our annual serving event, as you heard, is gonna be on September 15th and signups are available online or um, in the lobby. There's a table set up out there. We'd love for you to be a part of that big event and be an impact in people's lives all over the world. Listen, before we move on, we've got a couple of things that we want to do and, and talk to you about. There's going to be a QR code that comes up behind me in just a moment. It's going to have all the information that you hear from the platform today. But the first thing we want to do is we want to thank you for being here this morning. If this is your first time at Victory, thank you for being here. Uh, we're just so happy that you've decided to spend this hour with us, and we hope that you'll come back. But today, will you let us know you're here? You can do that a couple of different ways. You can scan that QR code, or you can just take your phone out. Uh, if you're watching online, you can do this too. Just type uh, the word new and text that to uh, 317-576-2288 and connect with us. If you're here in person, we have a gift for you. We'd love to give you at our Connection Center on your way out today. Uh, if you're watching online, we'll be glad to, to send one to you if you just let us know that you've connected. Now, if you've been here two weeks or more, if you call Victor your church home, we're so glad you're here too. We want to know you're here, so open up the Victory app and click on the check-in button. Let us know you're here. It's just a great way for us to stay connected with you and your family. Now, we have three things that we highlight every week. We call it the top three. It's the three things we think you need to know about. And this week in the top three, uh, you can uh, learn more about a group link. If you're not a part of a small group, you'll want to be a part of the group link event we're going to have next week and get connected to some folks. So go to the top three and check that out. We also have signups for Pack Away Hunger on the top three uh, this week. And then lastly, but not least, the high school gatherings start tonight. So this is an invitation. If, if you're a ninth to 12th grader, if you know a ninth to 12th grader, get them here tonight for the kickoff from six to eight. More information and more details all in the top three today. 
Now, uh, Josh is going to come in just a moment. He's going to continue our series called Doomsday Prep. We're in week two. But before he does, would you pray with me? Father, we come to you this morning with um, a desire to know you more. God, we thank you for already being here with us. And we just ask you to open our hearts, open our minds. God, give us today what you brought us here for. God, we just pray that you be with Josh and the message that you've given him would just flow through him in a way that uh, challenges and uh, God, it just, it opens our eyes to new things about you and your son. Father, we just pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. second week of doomsday prep, and we've been asking, are you ready? Or are you ready? Because the end of all things is, is near. And so that's, that's why from the very beginning, the first followers of Jesus urgently lived out their faith, saying, come, Lord Jesus, come. And every morning, they woke up believing, anticipating, perhaps today. Perhaps today. In fact, John 21 gives us some insight to this. Historically, this is an event that takes place after the resurrection, immediately after Jesus reinstates Peter for denying him three times. So this is emotional. Pete is full of shame and relief at the same time. So right after that, it says this, Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved, now that is John's nickname that he gave for himself. I'm sure the disciples had another nickname for him, right? But John gives us his nickname and this, to show his friendship with Jesus, his closeness with Jesus, the, the resurrected king, he pins these words. This is the one who, who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? So John is saying, Jesus gave me some inside information and Pete knew it. I mean, if you read the New Testament, you know how impulsive Peter is. So Peter says what he thinks. Peter thinks, acts without thinking. And in the middle of his shame, the first time he encountered Jesus after the resurrection, after he denied him, he is publicly corrected and reinstated. And immediately after that, Pete sees the teacher's pet, the disciple who Jesus loved. I mean, I wish we could just, just read the Bible. I wish we could hear the Bible as it took place. When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? I mean, Jesus answered him. Well, if I, if I want him to, so I have the power, I have the authority, I can do whatever I want. If I want him to, right, I remain alive until I return, what is that to you? So this is like parenting 101. This is like, let me worry about your brother. I just need you to do what I asked you to do. If I want him to remain alive until I, this is a big word, return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Then John is an eyewitness. He gives us some insight to this because of this interaction. 
Because of this incident, because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple, John, would not die. Meaning the first followers of Jesus thought Jesus would return in their lifetime. Before John dies, they believe, oh, Jesus is coming back. So they would wake up every day thinking perhaps today. They woke up every day anticipating, you know, I need to stay faithful. I need to be ready. And if you follow Jesus, those are our marching orders. Then John continues. He says, but Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive till I return, what is it to you? So when John is writing this, he's confronting a rumor. Not only that, he reminds us that sometimes, sometimes people say things and we miss the point. Has that ever happened to you? Me too. And also notice, John, as John pins these words, he still lived his life with urgency, anticipating the end of all things. John, who wrote the, the, the letter to, of Revelation to the seven churches in Asia Minor, he, he lived the same life he called them to live. Till his dying day, he anticipated that the end of all things was near. So he stayed faithful. He he was, he stayed ready. Because when Jesus returns, scripture informs us, it will be visible, majestic, cataclysmic, and without warning. I, I hope when it comes to this topic, you aren't just listening to me. I want you to dig into these scriptures, references here. And when you do, you'll find out the scripture informs us. When the day of the Lord comes, it will be visible, majestic, cataclysmic and without warning. So that means you won't have any time to pray anymore. You won't have time to give anymore. You won't have time to serve anymore. You won't have time to tell anybody else about Jesus. In fact, Jesus says it this way, but about the day or the hour, no one knows. So stop predicting. Like, don't you know, as Jesus followers, when we unsuccessfully predict the the second coming of Christ, we will lose our credibility People begin to think, hey, if they get the second coming wrong, what what makes them think that they they had the first coming right anyway? We have to stop predicting. Because Jesus says, no one knows. So stay ready. But about the day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son. Now, in my opinion, the Son knows now. Jesus said this when he was God in a bod, like when he was God wrapped in human flesh. So in that moment, he had given up some of his abilities so he, he didn't know, but only the father. And he goes on to say, as it is in the days of Noah, so it'll be at the coming of the son of man. Jesus is nicknamed for himself. For in those days, before the flood, people were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. And up to that day, Noah entered the ark. And so they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all Away. So that means people were living life and unaware and not ready. And then Jesus says this, this is how it'll be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in a field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand, uh, with a hand mill. One will be taken, the other left. Notice the word rapture isn't used there. Not only that, the people who are taken, Jesus does not reveal their standing with God. Why? Because it's not the point. He says this, therefore, so because of that, keep watch. Because of that, stay ready. Because you do not know what day the Lord, your Lord will come. So what's the point? Stay ready. What's the point? Be faithful. And then he says something to the Jesus followers. He gives them this parable, which is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. He says, but understand this. If the owner, and just so you know, the owner is you. The owner is me. If the owner of of the house had known what time that night the thief was coming, to which you say, oh, who's the thief? And in this instance, and I know it feels weird to say this, but the thief is Jesus. Why? Because he's going to take us by surprise. Why? Because this is going to happen suddenly. Why? Because you won't have any time to predict it. So if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch. He would have stayed ready and would not have let that his house be broken into. And so you also must be, what's that word? Ready. Ready because the son of man, Jesus, will come at an hour when you do not expect him. So Jesus, what I'm hearing you say is we should lay out all of these timelines to predict the end of time and then argue about it with other Christians, right? No, no, stay ready. 
Be faithful. Why? Because the the day of the Lord will come, and when it does, it will shake you to your core and take you by surprise. So are you ready? Is your family ready? Is your life ready? Is your heart ready? Are, Are you ready? I need to remind you when it comes to the interpretations of end times, how it happens is not a salvation issue. When I say not a salvation issue, it means that this is not something that should cause Jesus' followers to reject each other. Specifically, how it happens, it's not a salvation issue, but that it happens is. The end of all things is near. Are you ready? Now, after last week, I I did hear some murmurs of disagreement with me. So I just want you to know, I I do my homework. I realize that there are different views on end times. And uh, the most popular one by far uh, was made more popular through the fictional Left Behind books. It's called Dispensational Premillennialism. Dispensational Premillennialism. And this is in your app. This is in your notes. If you want to scroll to the bottom of your app, you can make it bigger. But Dispensational Premillennialism uh, is, so you have the church age, you have the secret rapture, you have the great tribulation, you have the second coming, and then the, the reign, the millennium reign of the physical kingdom, and then all the way out here, you have the final judgment. But this is just the belief that there will be a secret rapture, a great tribulation, the second coming of Christ, a physical kingdom, and a millennium reign before the final judgment. So you have a lot of markers before the final judgment. Now, the earliest that we can trace this view back historically is into the 1800s. This view emerged in the 1800s with the Plymouth Brethren from Ireland. So this is dispensational premillennialism, and it's the most popular. So when it comes to end times, there's another view called the postmillennialism. Again, this is all in your app. But you have the church age, right? Then you have the tribulation or the great tribulation. You have the millennium, then the second coming and and final judgment. But post-millennialism is the belief that after a great period of of tribulation, the uh, millennium reign, the second coming and final judgment will occur. And from a Christian perspective, worldview, this view right here has all but died out. I don't remember talking to anybody who actually holds this view. It comes from the 1100s. The earliest post-millennialist is Joachim Fiore, right? But but that is post-millennialism. Another view about end times is actually called historic pre-millennialism. So so you have the church age, you have a great tribulation, you have the second coming of Christ, then the millennium reign, the physical reign of a physical kingdom. But this is historic pre-millennialism. Premillennialism, and it's the belief that the second coming of Christ will precede the millennium, and the church has replaced the nation of Israel as God's covenant people. That's what the people who hold this, that's what they believe. Now, most historic premillennialists believe that Christians will remain on earth during this great tribulation. And the tribulation will only purify the churches, rooting out all of the false believers. And this view goes all the way back to 100 AD. The historic premillennialism is the belief, uh, is, is the earliest view of end times among Christians. Many early church fathers, including Arrhenius and Justin Martyr, have held this view. Now, these aren't all of the views. But before before I share with you my view, I just want to set the stage a little bit with some hermeneutical understanding, meaning before we interpret a text on the topic, we need to find uh, what the, the, our approach to scripture, our approach to the Bible. So as Jesus followers, when we read the Bible, we have to realize that there are different genres of literature in our, our Bible. In fact, there are probably seven general genres. Uh, You'll have the historical narrative, like Joshua, Judges, Ruth, Kings. It's a retelling of historical events. Then you'll have the law, like Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They outline God's commands to his people. You'll have poetry, Psalms and Lamentations, and Song of Solomon, songs of poetry full of symbolic language. They give praises, plead for help, convey wisdom. You'll have prophecy, wisdom literature, and apocalyptic literature. Now, there are different genres of literature. And when it comes to the New Testament's description of doomsday, it is the apocalyptic literature that you and I are reading. It's a genre of scripture that predicts future and present realities, that uses symbolic language and numbers and word pictures, images and beings that often seem strange to us. 
It is used to comfort and extort uh, uh, oppressed people, exhort oppressed people. So, so when it comes to our doomsday prep, you and I will be reading apocalyptic literature. Now, you can find this kind of literature in the Old Testament when the prophets are pre- describing the Babylonian exile. And in the New Testament, it's used to describe the second coming of Christ. And in both instances, they use figurative language, beings, and numbers that help communicate a heavenly reality using earthly image. So apocalyptic literature is a genre of scripture that predicts future and present realities that uses symbolic language, numbers, and word pictures, images, and beings that often seem strange to us. Right? It's often used to comfort and exhort an oppressed people to help describe the undescribable. Now, you can find this genre in in these books right here. Again, this is all in your notes. But when you read it, here's what you'll find. Figurative language that will help us define literal things. Not only that, remember most of the time that the, the people writing this had to write in code. Why? Because they were writing to an oppressed people. And so if they call out Rome, what, they give Rome ammunition to come and wipe them out. They are a persecuted church. Now, in the opening part of Revelation, get this, it is historical as well. There are parts of Revelation that are historical. There are parts of Revelation that are absolutely literal. In fact, it starts off with this way. It says this letter is from John to the seven churches in the province of, of Asia. All of that to say he's writing to a particular people at a particular place at a particular time. I mean, again, all of that to say this, that when you and I are reading Revelation, we need to read it in context. We have to read it in context. But, but the, so many views ignore the figurative language. They say it's all literal. That it's, this is a literal interpretation. And then they'll throw in some Old Testament verses too about, get this, the exile in Babylon or the attack on Jerusalem that happened in 70 AD. Both of those things had already happened. We're going to study that more, right? But in the three approaches, all three approaches, they use words like tribulation, rapture, and millennium. But as a Jesus follower, you need to know the word millennium is is not found anywhere in, in Scripture. And the idea of a thousand year millennium reign of a physical king and physical kingdom, they're imported Mainly, the ideas are brought to the New Testament text through the Old Testament text. The only place this idea is is described in the whole New Testament is in a section of scripture that we're going to read together in apocalyptic literature. So it's just just so you're aware, it's mentioned in the midst of symbolic language. So, So here it is. It says, I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss. And holding in its hand a great chain, he sees the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. So this is where people get the idea of the millennium reign. The term millennium is is actually the Latin word for a thousand. But but I want you to look at the text. What, What did John just do? He uses figurative images and symbols, and then he pauses to define for us what he's talking about so we don't miss it. So what does he redefine in this passage? The millennium reign of Christ's rule and reign of his physical kingdom? No. It says he sees the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the, the devil or Satan. His focus was on our enemy. And when you and I focus only on the millennium reign, we are missing the point. The point really is Satan is limited for a thousand years, which seems like a really long what? Time. Look at verse three. It says, when he threw him, Satan, into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. And after that, he must be set free for a what? Short time. Well, how long is a short time? I don't know. Why? Because that's not the point. So Josh, do you mean to tell me that the only place in the whole New Testament where we get the idea of this millennium reign is from this text? Yeah, yeah. See, the point of this passage is about our enemy and and how he has limited ability, not these millennium reigns. In fact, in Revelation 20, one through six, the millennium describes a symbolic period of time, get this, where our enemy is limited. 
Not only that, it's important to know, Scripture frequently uses the number 1,000 figuratively. But, but for us, we need to know that the millennium reign describes a symbolic period of time where our enemy is limited. So this passage isn't about the supreme reign of Jesus. No, it's about the binding up of our enemy. And th this is huge. Jesus said, this has already happened. In fact, in Mark chapter 3, Jesus is casting out demons, and the Pharisees are accusing Jesus of being from Satan. And Jesus says this, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. In the context, Jesus says, our enemy is the strong man. And again, Jesus is what? He's the thief, which sounds weird, but he is robbing Satan. Do you know what this text means? The clock started on the millennium reign when Jesus was still on earth. Je Jesus says it this way. No one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. And then he can plunder the strong man's house. And you might think, Josh, what is he robbing Satan of? Souls. He's saving them. He's rescuing them from hell. Scripturally, if you want to talk about the millennium, you need to know that you're talking about a symbolic period of time where the enemy is limited. And every time you and I lead someone to Christ, we are stealing them from Satan. I mean, how cool is that? We should make up T-shirts, stealing from Satan. We'd be a weird church. But, but, but in other words, when we give and when we serve and when we love others to active faith in Christ, we are stealing from Satan. And another word that you'll find in the charts is, is one that we talked about last week. We said the word rapture, rapture is nowhere in the Bible, but the idea of it is. Now, now remember, the idea of a secret rapture cannot be found in any Christian literature before 1830. I added another resource to our resource page this week called The Origin of the Rapture. I didn't write it, but if you disagree with me, just check it out. And just to be clear, we believe there will be a rapture. But here's how scripture defines it. We're going to let scripture define it. It describes believers being caught up to meet Christ. And finally, another word that you'll find on these charts is the word tribulation or great tribulation. And the tribulation describes believers being persecuted, afflicted, and suffering trouble or hardships because of their faith in Jesus. Not because they're jerks, right? But because of their faith in Jesus. And the Greek word for tribulation is also used to describe a pressing together. It's actually used on how they were squeezed or to stomp grapes to make wine. Doesn't life feel like you got stomped on sometimes? That's, that's the tribulation. So Jesus says, hey, in this world, you will have trouble. Jesus warns, hey, don't be surprised if the world hates you. So if you're suffering because of your faith in Jesus, tribulation is to be expected. That means, and this is important in Scripture, tribulation in the name of Jesus is not tied to punishment. That's what so many people think. Well, God must be punishing me. God is mad at me. No, they're tied to, get this, spiritual growth, preparation for eternity, trust and intimacy with God. James, Jesus' half-brother, says it this way. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials, also translated a temptation, a testing, a persecution, an affliction, a hardship, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that, oh, you mean there's a reason for this? There's a purpose for our pain? Yeah, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. In the lens of the second coming of Christ, tribulation describes believers being persecuted and afflicted, suffering trouble or hardships because of their faith in Jesus. So if you hurt, or you don't understand, if you think things in this world are not as they should be, God agrees with you. This world, it's not your home. See, Jesus' first coming was about divine rescue, about the grace of God. But the second coming is a time where the king will set right and restore all things. In fact, John says it this way, look, he is coming on the clouds and every eye will see him. What does that mean? It won't be a secret. When Christ returns, it will be visible, majestic, cataclysmic, and without warning. That is why I hold the amillennial view. All millennial literally means anti-millennium, but that's not actually an accurate description 
of the view, all millennial is the belief that the millennium symbolizes Christ's spiritual reign from Pentecost to his imminent return with the tribulation as ongoing spiritual struggle. And if you hold this view, here's what you believe. The millennium is now. The church age is now. And every day you and I wake up, we are living in the last days. Now, historically speaking, all millennialism can be traced back to the 300s of Augustine. He was the first all millennialist that we know about. Now, now there are other views, absolutely. But I, I hope that this kind of stands out to you. That the most popular view of end time events that we have today came to us in the 1800s. So 1,500 years after the main views. Now, when I see so many views, it makes me wonder, okay, why? But then I see all of these like little markers, right? The tribulation, the rapture, the kingdom. And I think, oh, they like to believe that because they can predict it so then they can get serious. They can predict it so that they can go tell their family. They can predict it so that then they might try to change or get, you know. And when we, if we try to predict the end times, we're missing the point, the point is to stay faithful. The point is to be ready. Now, if you don't follow Jesus, I'll be transparent. My view is the most scary because the end will come without warning. It will come like a thief and it will rob you of what you thought you had. Time. Are you ready? Is your family ready? Are you living as if the end is, is near? See, when it comes to the two oldest views, uh, the, the main difference between these two views comes down to the main reason the Israelites didn't recognize Jesus as Messiah. They were looking for a physical king and a physical kingdom. So they believed if he really was the king, that he was going to be a good king like King David. He would be richer than King Solomon. If he was king, he would deliver health and wealth and Jewish world dominance. They were looking for a physical kingdom and a physical king. And their biggest problem with Jesus was simply this, as a Messiah, Messiahs aren't supposed to suffer. Messiahs aren't supposed to die. When you read the New Testament, you discover Jesus launched a spiritual kingdom. Jesus said it this way. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. I'm a spiritual king. I bring a spiritual kingdom. Now, if you hold another view and you are waiting for the millennial reign to get serious with your life, you should check out Mark chapter 9. It says, Jesus went on to say, I tell you the truth, some standing here right now will not die before they see the kingdom of God arrive in great power. So when Jesus goes to the cross, he purchases the kingdom. The death and burial and resurrection of Jesus established the kingdom. And at Pentecost, Jesus initiates the kingdom. That's what Luke is describing in Acts chapter 2. The disciples saw the kingdom of God arrive with their own eyes. And from that time to this time, the call on every Jesus follower is to stay ready, to be faithful. In fact, Mark records Jesus' is teaching before the Passover festival and the Last Supper. He says, about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. So be on guard, be alert. You do not know what time you will come, to which you say, Josh, we've read that before. No, that was Matthew. Jesus keeps saying it because he doesn't want us to miss it. And then he adds this passage. It's like a man going away. Who is that? Well, that's Jesus. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge. Who is that? That's the Jesus followers, each with their assigned task. And he tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, because of that, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the ro rooster crows or at dawn. And if he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. Don't let Jesus catch you off guard. And then Jesus says this, what I say to you, I say to what? Everyone. Watch, be ready, stay faithful, because the end of all things is near. Are you ready? In Luke chapter 12, Jesus says, be dressed and ready for service and keep your lamps burning for like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet. So who are the servants? We are. Who is the master? He is like servants waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching. And when he comes, truly I tell you, he will dress himself to serve. He'll have, we'll have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. It will be good for all of those servants who find the master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or toward daybreak. What does that mean? Well, we don't know when he's going to return. 
but we need to be ready. And then Jesus repeats a parable that we just read in Mark chapter 3. Why? Because it's important. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. Are you ready? Because when Jesus returns, it will be visible, majestic, cataclysmic, and without warning. Are you ready? And you might be thinking, Josh, I, I hear what you're saying, but I, I'm not sure I'm, I'm ready. I just want to give you a little test. What qualifies me to enter the kingdom of God? Right, when it comes to heaven, when it comes to dwelling with God, when it comes to being spiritually ready for Jesus' return, I just want you to think in your head, what qualifies you to enter the kingdom of God? I want you to think about it. What's the very first thing that comes to your mind? Just think about it. Is it a prayer you prayed? Is it money you've given? Is it attendance-based? Is it how much you sacrificed? Is it, is it how much you served? Is it how much sin you didn't do? So you, Jesus got, owes you heaven. Like when, you, when Jesus returns, how do you know if you're ready? And you might think, hey, Josh, I think I know when I'm ready. If God grades on a curve, because I think I'm better than 50% of those people over there. Like, right, is it performance-based? What qualifies me to enter the kingdom of, of God? What was the very first thing that came to your mind? See, this is eternally important, so I need you to hear me. If anything you thought of had to do with you, you're wrong. If you think it's about how good you've done or the bad that you've avoided, it, like if that's what you were counting on to be ready, hear me, it's not enough. You will never make it. See, Christianity at its core is not about self-help, about you and I willing ourselves to achieve heaven. At its core, Christianity is a divine rescue. This is about the grace of God. This is about the sacrifice of Jesus. So when it comes to the question, what qualifies me to enter the kingdom of God, if anything came to mind other than Jesus' sacrifice for you, you have the wrong view. There's nothing you can do to save you. There's no amount of good deeds. There's no amount of money. There's no amount of service. There's nothing you can do to save you. The core of Christianity isn't about self-help, but divine rescue, which means this is a rescue mission, saving us from eternal separation from God, complete hopelessness, eternal pain. The only way that we can be ready has nothing to do with you, and it has everything to do with what Jesus has already done. So if you follow Jesus, I want to challenge you simply with this. Do my friends think I believe that Jesus could return in my lifetime? Because we have good news of divine rescue. Like Jesus, we could be stealing from Satan. So my challenge, if you follow Jesus, do my friends think I actually believe that Jesus could return in my lifetime? Now, now, if you're here today and you struggle to have that assurance that Jesus could love you or accept you, the first followers of Jesus could say, me too. You're not alone. In fact, on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, Peter is preaching, and people are freaked out. Check this out. God has made Jesus whom you crucified. So Peter's talking to the very people who crucified Jesus. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. That, that's an oh no moment. We killed him, but God made him Messiah. We killed him, but God made him God's final king. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And I read that and think, I bet they were. They're like, what do we do? What will God do to us? We're not ready for his wrath. And so they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And the convicting power of God came upon them because they thought they needed to do something. They, 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 they can't wait. And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you. Every one of you. Not the ones that have their act together, every one of you. Not the ones that have demonstrated a sufficient level of holiness. No, every one of you in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, meaning that the people who are far from God can have assurance that they are ready. Those who accepted his message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to their number. After they studied the Bible for three months, no. No. After they memorized selective passages of scripture, 
No. After they demonstrated a sufficient level of righteousness in their life? No. After they prayed about it and went home? No, you never have to pray about a clear command from God. Scripture says, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And here's the question. Why shouldn't this day be that day for you? The day you were made ready to meet Jesus. The day you were ready to surrender to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Scripture says, hey, there's going to be a day where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. So ready or not, everybody's going to do it. But if you got baptized today, you'd be ready for that day. Could this day be that day for you? Could this day be the day that a dad knows for sure he's ready, that he leads his family to be ready? Could this day be that day for you? Could this day be the day that a mom who's trying to clean up her act before she follows Jesus realizes, I'll never do it without Jesus. Could this day be that day for her? Could this day be the day that a teenager who says, I'm so moved by God's pursuit of me and I'm thankful for my parents, but this is not my parents' faith, this is my faith. I, myself, I wanna be ready. Could this day be that day for them? See, we have the towels and we have the shirts and shirts. We even have a hair dryer. If you're ready, when we sing this song, just meet me over here in the corner of this platform. You need to know, I gotta warn you, baptism is not a magic trick. It does not make you perfect. It's not gonna wash away all of your bad habits, but it is the time in scripture that we can claim new life in Christ, where we can link our life with his life. And in that moment, is a time where we can point to and say, I knew I was ready. Not because I did anything. No, I was accepting what was done for me in place of me because the end of all things is near. And that phrase should either thrill you or terrify you because the end is either the end of everything for you or it's really just the end of one thing and the beginning of a new thing, a better thing, an eternal thing. Are you ready? I want you to be ready. Could this be the day that you're finally ready? We invite you to stand and worship with us this morning.
You guys can go ahead and grab a seat. Uh, this is Jason, and I, I love that this day is that day for you. And we just repeat after me: I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the Living God, the Son of the Living God. And I accept Him, I accept Him as my Lord, as my Lord, and my Savior, and my Savior. Because your confession of faith, I have the privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of all of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Congratulations, brother. so glad you're here today. This day is that day for you. Now, what I love about this is all of our sins are forgiven. And when the enemy comes at you and suggests that you're not ready, you're not holy, you're not worthy, you remember this day. Okay? Would you repeat after me? I believe, I believe that, Jesus the Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. And I accept him. And I accept him. As my Lord. As my Lord. And my Savior. And my because your confession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of all of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. I bet when you woke up this morning, you didn't think you'd be here. I did it. I'm glad you're here today. This day is that day for you. It's my first time. It's your first time. Awesome. Awesome. That's a pretty good ex first experience. Oh, would you repeat after me? I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. And I accept Him. And I accept Him as my Lord. As my Lord. And my Savior. And my Savior. Because your confession of Christ, I want to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Congratulations. What a good day it is for you. Would you repeat after me? I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. And I accept Him. I accept Him. As my Lord. As my Lord. And my Savior. And my Savior. Because your confession of faith, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Congratulations. Thank you so much for joining us for Victory On Demand. Here at Victory, we believe we all have a next step and we pray that God uses what you have experienced here today to stir something in your life and lead you to the next step in your faith journey, whatever that may be. If you'd like to talk to someone about taking your next step, please let us know by clicking on the button that's popping up on your screen now. Here at Victory, we are contributors, not just consumers, and we consider it a privilege to give back what God has so freely given to us. We celebrate generosity and the work God does through our sacrificial giving in our community and around the world. If your experience today has helped you or blessed you in any way, we invite you to partner with us financially in our vision of connecting people back to God by going to victorycc.life slash give. Again, if you haven't experienced a live victory service yet, we invite you to visit victorycc.life for more information on when and where you can join us in person or online. Remember, here at Victory, we don't just go to church, we are the church everywhere we go. We'll see you next time.